You know, as far as I can tell, of all the changes that have happened to building materials over the last 50 years or so, the one that I have to say has changed the most and where technology has made the biggest impact, it's just got to be the wood product, right? Engineered wood product. You saw lots of them go into this house, and you're going to see a few more before it's done. But right up there along with that, you know, maybe in the top five in residential construction, it's just got to be insulation. I've seen a lot of insulation systems come and go over the years. Sometimes it seems like every time I turn around, there's some improvement to the process or the material. Now, over the last two or three years, a lot of comments have been posted about what insulation are we going to use? What is the latest and greatest? And it sounds like the consensus is it's either rock wool or spray foam, depending on who you talk to. But I've used home insulation services here in Roseburg for the last 15 years or so. And when I asked Kyle, the owner, about my choices, he convinced me to use this system, which is a combination of unfaced fiberglass bats and blown-in cellulose. It's the best all-around choice in our climate. And I hope you enjoy watching these guys do their demanding and too often thankless jobs. The R value of insulation is a way to compare the resistance to heat transfer that the insulation provides. Heat is always trying to establish thermal equilibrium, that is, distribute itself evenly everywhere all the time. And the job of the insulation at the exterior surfaces of the living space of a house is to reduce or slow down this heat transfer just as much as is practical. The decision about practicality in insulation is a function of energy costs versus the cost of the insulation versus the weather conditions where you live. So maybe the extreme examples of this are, you know, think of the International Space Station and a beach house in Hawaii. Okay, the insulation that's used and the energy required to keep people alive in the absolute zero temperature condition of space is one of the primary considerations, and it doesn't matter how much it costs. But on the beach in the South Pacific, insulation is almost useless because the people there keep their windows open 24-7. So why would you spend any money or any time to insulate at all? Now, building codes make these decisions for most of us. And Oregon has recently increased its insulation requirements, so that's what we are meeting and in some instances exceeding the code requirements as they exist today. The insulation is in this thing, and every milestone accomplished feels really good at this point. 
So let's come on in and I'll show you what it looks like in place. There's two different broad general categories of insulation and maybe it'll give you some, side, some kind of a good idea about what you might think about when it comes time to insulate something that you're building. So there are two types of insulation in this house, fiberglass bats and blow-in. We're in the garage right now, and by code, the exterior wall in the garage didn't even have to be insulated because it's not living space. The ceiling in the garage is the floor for the bonus room upstairs, and so that had to be insulated, but with floor insulation code requirements, which is R38 in the lid floor, and we put R19 in the wall. You may hear me talk about R values, our value measures resistance to heat transfer. How much this tends to insulate and keep the inside the right temperature and the outside, whatever that is. R19 in the walls used to be standard. It's not anymore. It's not code compliant. So even though we could use it on the exterior walls in the garage, not living area, we couldn't use it on the exterior walls in the rest of the house. Now you may be used to seeing sort of a brown colored paper face with little ears that fold out and are stapled in fiberglass bats for walls and ceilings. Well, they don't do that much anymore. Apparently they decided maybe two things, guessing here, but it's just not worth the effort because friction will keep these bats in the cells. And second, mold loves to eat paper. And so mold is not going to be as eager to get started without the paper that's on the, ins on the insulation. And I guess between these two considerations of ease of manufacture and a reduced perception of a mold vulnerability, they decided just to forego that. And it didn't take these boys long to put it in. I can tell you that. Let me know if there's more to the decision to not have, you know, paper face on fiberglass bats. I mean, there's undoubtedly a lot of stuff there that I am clueless about. So go ahead and put that in the notes. But speaking of things that I'm clueless about, here's something I'm not clueless about that generated a lot of questions on an earlier video. This electrical panel has no insulation behind it. And right over here is the meter base, which as you can see has greatly reduced insul insulation over the top of it. Doesn't matter, because this is the garage. By code, like I mentioned, we don't even have to insulate the walls in this space. And so whatever reduction there is in our value at these electrical enclosures is a non-issue. The other thing that's a non-issue is any air infiltration that may be happening around this meter base. Just doesn't matter. So all of these things on balance, this garage is going to be part of the area that's being used. It has to be sheetrocked to reduce the fire exposure, and it would just be foolish not to go ahead and put some amount of insulation, in this case, R19, behind the sheetrock as long as you're doing it. Let's go into the downstairs and I'll show you what blown in cellulose looks like. So I'm standing in what will be the kitchen. The backyard, such as it is, is just outside of this two by six exterior wall. This blown in insulation is entirely around the perimeter of the living space in our exterior walls, which are all two by six. Fairly recently, I'm gonna say in the last three years, but I'm not sure about that, the insulation code has changed here in Oregon to where you need at least, if I have this right, R25 in a two by six exterior wall. The only way for us to get that around here in any sort of a cost-effective way is with this blown in cellulose it gets more R value than you can possibly get with fiberglass bats. And not only does it get a bigger R value, but it fills everything. I mean, think of it. We've got a electrical box right here. This cellulose is blown in behind that just as tight as it is out here in the middle. And it's blown in behind, let's come down here and look at this block for the curtain rod backing. That is stuffed behind that block just as tightly as it is anywhere else. And you just can't do that with fiberglass. I really like it. So I'll mention while I'm standing next to all these windows that however energy efficient your house is, your windows are the problem. Here's what I mean. Great insulation, minimal insulation. But you can't live in a house without windows. So it's a trade-off, right? But be aware that the windows that you design into the house that you're going to live in are going to cost you money over time in increased energy costs. 
So while I'm standing here next to this window, I'm reminded that the first thing these guys did when they walked on site was to go around with spray foam and seal up every opening. They went around every window, every door, every penetration through the bottom plate or the top plate that we didn't already get because we had already taken a stab at it. But that doesn't do much for the R value of the wall, but it does a lot for air infiltration, which is part of the same problem, and that is reducing energy transfer and drafts and you know everything that goes along with letting what's out there in here. So you see these apparently random pieces of insulation that are hanging between these two by four studs? These are, in many cases, an acceptable alternative to a fire block. And my insulators were attentive enough and sort of responsible enough to think, hmm, on their way out, there's some spots with no fire blocks. We've got some pieces of fiberglass that stuff them in there. I mean, that's two things, right? That's, that's just making sure you don't have a problem with an inspector, and that's a couple of guys who have got their head into the game. Fiberglass insulation insulates against heat transfer and sound transfer. And if you're building a house, you might decide to put insulation between living space and bedroom space, you know, in a second floor like that, or between living space and office space or bathroom space. You could insulate every interior partition if you wanted. We decided not to. So the upstairs, two by six walls, just the same as the downstairs, but the ceiling is way different. Different than the garage um, floor, different than anything else in the structure, and that is it's R49. Now that's a lot of resistance to heat transfer. The other thing is that the insulation is down against the ceiling and not up against the roof. That's important because you have to have free movement of air against the roof to take care of any condensation that happens between the heat gain at the top of the insulation and the cold temperatures at the bottom of the roof diaphragm, right? I mean, you've got a chance there for condensation to happen. So there's two or three things that are happening here to mitigate that, control it, and make it a non-issue. You see this baffle, this styrofoam chute? It's loosely attached to the roof from side to side in the cavity, and it dives down and protects my e-vent, remember those e-vents that I put in, from being blocked by the fiberglass. If they're blocked by the fiberglass right out here over the exterior wall, then there's no way for the air to travel on the top side of this styrofoam and, re and remove the moisture that's trying to accumulate between the warm air, which exists here, and the cold surface that exists up there. So you have movement of air, and a nice thick layer of insulation to keep the inside of this space comfortable. In the areas of the upstairs with flat ceilings, which is most of it, there is less attention paid to air circulation because there's a big attic space up there for the air to move around in, and more attention paid to increasing the resistance to heat transfer with two layers of fiberglass. We've got an R30 blanket, and an R19 blanket, which adds up, if my math is right, to R49 in the ceilings. That's a lot of insulation. And consequently, it's going to be a good energy savings over time in this house. So we're in the bonus room. Same treatment on the lid. 14 inch TJIs makes nice air transfer over the top of the fiberglass. But out here in the attic, we're not gonna put drywall out here. Nobody wants to fight you know, sheets of drywall out and try to hold those up and fasten them. So they just rolled out and fastened this radiant reinforced craft paper, whatever it is, to protect the insulation from the people and the people from the insulation and make a nice, tidy, um, and practical finish to a ceiling that's just in a, an attic storage area. I learned as a kid that I didn't enjoy insulating. It's not pleasant work. And I learned years ago as a general contractor that insulation specialists buy their insulation in such quantities that they can buy the material and put it in place for less money than I could buy the material in many cases. So I don't know enough about insulation to know, to really be, um, be able to compare the quality of an insulation job um, from an informed perspective. But I know this. Anytime a subcontractor shows up on time, does the work on budget, cleans up when they're done, and it passes inspection without a hiccup, that's a good subcontractor. That's what happened here. It's happened just about every time that I've used these guys, and so I will continue to use them. Now, before I sign off, I have to point out that this is, has been perhaps the most seamless sort of 
handing off of the baton that we've had in this job. And that is, the insulation was done on, on uh, Thursday, and the drywall is going to get here on Monday. So day after tomorrow, drywall showing up, going to start banging some boards, and really changing the look of the inside of this project. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up that good work. <music>